uh, Amanda, go ahead and, and, okay. and I'll say if you open any remarks too when you're done. All right. So this is Armando Rosales. I'm the, one of the command MAGCOM entomologists for the Air Force, and I've been working with Dr. Stephen Inlow, University of Florida Center for Invasive and Aquatic Plants, or I should say aquatic and invasive plants, I believe is proper, uh, over about five years. And we've been looking at trying to get, one of the things the Air Force does is we get stuck in our, we get it stuck in a rut on what we're using on the, on the active ingredients we use. So we use things, we'll find something that works and we'll stick with it for decades. And we don't do a good job at looking at modern herbicides that can dramatically reduce our, the pounds of active ingredient we're putting out in, in our in our ranges and our un unimproved lands. And so Dr. Inlow has been very helpful looking at specifically Brazilian pepper over the years and getting it down from gallons to milliliters per acre. Um, and the other thing he looked at, I was quite impressed with, is he also looked at our efficiency applying in the field, the time in the field, so uh, maximizing our, our workforce. And we've been looking just at Florida bases and uh, and share, not really sharing this outside of Florida. And I thought, well, why don't we share this outside of the United States, outside of Florida to the rest of CONUS and not just keep it to the Air Force. So I introduced Dr. Stephen Inlow and then also guest speaker, uh, Steve Manning. And I don't know, I've just met Steve by hearsay. <laughs> so, but he is, I've written this down from Invasive Plant Control, but he's also the president of Northwest Invasive Plant Council. And maybe Dr. Inlow, when you get a chance, you could probably do a much better job of an introduction. <laughs> Absolutely. I could. And then Doug, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, hey, uh, uh, Armando helping, many thanks for helping to coordinate these uh, these two webinars that we've had for the last two weeks. Uh, today, certainly we've got uh, the invasive species dream team of, of uh, Dr. Stephen Enlow and, and uh, Steve Manning to talk about the spotted lanternfly, an issue that's certainly going to impact DOD for many years to come for movement from our cargo. And uh, really from the Armed Forces Pest Management Board community uh, and, and, and our, our director, uh, Colonel Mark Carter, I really, I, I thank, uh, I thank you, the speakers, and 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 Amanda, as you as the biosecurity subcommittee chair, and and all of our DoD members and our 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 um, uh, our, our teammates from the U.S. Army Corps that are here today. Uh, these these are record numbers of people that we have for these these webinars here, and so we are just honored that you guys uh, take your time to to join us today. And the information is just absolutely outstanding. So enjoy with that. I'm going to turn it over to the Dream Team. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh my goodness, Doug, you are too kind. Um, let me share my screen here, and uh, we'll get this thing started. Y'all should be able to see the PowerPoint, and um, so you should be able to see the the title slide for the PowerPoint. Correct. Yes, sir. Yep. Okay, excellent. So, um, you know, I spoke last week on Phragmites, and 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 my interesting goal in working with DoD on this is to sort of really uh, increase uh, <clears throat> the interaction and um, and delivery of a lot of uh, scientific information for all kinds of invasive plants. And, you know, last week I did it by myself, but one of the things I've realized and learned is oftentimes a conversational approach to talking about invasives linked between an academic and a, an a outstanding um, <clears throat> manager or contractor is a really great approach. And Steve Manning is a friend of mine. I've known him for years now. We've co-authored uh, I'm management guide for invasive plants in the southeastern U.S. And he is, you know, uh, the president of invasive plant control, the company. Oh, OK. okay. Can you all see my screen? No, no it's, it's we lost it. Yeah. OK. All right. Let me uh, let me come back to it here. Hang on. Um, this is I'm sorry. This just threw me for a loop here. Um, <laughs> It's like I have two openings here. Okay. All right. Oh, wow. All right. Give me a half a second here. Um, Steve, if you want to say a, say a few words uh, just uh, just to the sure. group while I get figured out exactly what just happened here. Sure. And, uh, I'll get this back up and. Sure. Glad. Take, take your time. So. Okay. Really excited to be here. We have. Um, Stephen and I kind of figured out that it's a lot of fun and a little more interesting to actually have this conversational type of presentation. Uh, we did one not too long ago. Gosh, I don't even remember what we did it on. Was it Kudzu? Yeah, Kudzu. Yeah, Kudzu. Kudzu. So 
going to do it again today with Tree of Heaven. And uh, now that your screen's back up, I'll let you go until you throw it back at me. Excellent. Okay, so which one um, of those guys am I, by the way, on the fence? There? <laughs> which which one do you want to be? <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'll tell you right. later. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Um, you know, so Tree of Heaven. This is uh, this is probably one of the more charismatic national uh, invasive woody species you know that is so prominent across the country we know it well as ailanthus altissima and what's interesting is that ailanthus comes from the name sky tree because the perception was this stuff would grow to the sky really really fast back when it was being named something is from a family that we're not very familiar with here in, in the u.s especially some of rubaceae which is mostly a tropical family now here's something scary for you steve that you might not have known there's about uh, there's almost a dozen other ailanthus species in Southeast Asia that we don't have. So right? amazingly enough, um, we've only gotten one, um, but uh, there are other other things lurking in the wings over there that could be just as problematic as as ailanthus altissima. Wow. Um, this is a plant that's also had a long history here in the U.S., going back to the 1700s. Uh, introductions from in Pennsylvania, and then again in the 1890s uh, when um, Immigrants brought it uh, into California. So we got multiple introductions on both coasts with a very long history. You know, and those types of things tend to um, result in, in, in the increase of problems. And as you can sort of see here, we've got both a East Coast distribution and a West Coast distribution. And I see people continue to pile into the meeting here. It's a little distracting as they uh, keep coming in here, but, uh, but that's great, more the merrier here. You know, this is EdMaps data, Steve, and I know that you've uh, probably submitted a whole lot here, yeah. but you've worked on Tree of Heaven in how many states do you think in terms of uh, across the U.S. now? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, definitely up and down the East Coast. I mean, every one of those states has a green mark and it should. Um, Midwest, definitely. Uh, Northwest, certainly. Washington, Oregon. Um I don't see Alaska on here, but I would think that it's up in Anchorage and <laughs> that by now. I hope not, but possibly so. Yeah, so you, so as you can see, you know, the Phragmites map kind of filled in the upper Midwest, um, but uh, but in this case, um, you know, this is probably the most prominent invasive tree we have here in the U.S. This was also the tree that the book of Tree Grows in Brooklyn was written about a, a long, long time ago, and um, you know and it really shows the cultural significance of this plant and and that has, has been so strongly rooted within urban areas for so many decades now that it's literally the only urban tree that a lot of people can even recognize in many cases because it's been so tolerant of urban conditions and so you know culturally we kind of have this issue with tree of heaven that goes beyond just it being an invasive plant but actually being the only dang tree that'll grow in some places <laughs> and so you know, when we think about its growth form, it can be a tree up to 80 feet tall. Uh, we often see very dense clonal stands of it like this. You can see a small patch here with many, many stems um, that we are looking to manage. I want to go through some identification, but I'm going to do it quickly because we really want to get into the heart of control for this. And um, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but I've provided this in a PowerPoint, which I will freely share. Um, I'll upload this to the, the DOD uh, website here after we're done and you can have this take it run with it um, and um, use it as you see fit but Ilanthus, and I'll go back and forth between Ilanthus and tree of heaven I'm talking about the same thing there but you can take a look uh, the new growth is very distinct uh, with very chestnut brown stems older trees uh, has a nice pale gray bark to it and Steve when you're out in the field you know you do a lot of work um, in the winter time and the, the late fall winter on tree of heaven and so when you're teaching your folks how to identify trees without leaves what are some of the things you key in on on tree of heaven well i think one of the easiest is the the scar there that you see in that picture on the left the um i people say it looks like an angel um i think that's a very distinctive um way to identify tree of heaven the other way is if you're close to a branch and you just break it it's the smell that you get off of it it's very distinct as well um the bark is much smoother than most of the bark in the forest you'll get some look-alikes and some things you have to be careful of um uh, hercules club is one of those uh sumac is another one but 
um, that scar is probably the most distinctive uh, differentiation. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. So when it is leafed out, you know, we have these massive compound leaves that typically have anywhere between 10 and 41 leaflets. So these things can literally be up to four feet long on larger trees. And they have something very unique. And there's another, uh, there's the angel right there. Some people say it's heart shaped. And that's where these large compound leaves actually attach to the stems. And so when they drop off in the fall, they're left with those uh, uh, leaf scale scars there, uh, which are so, so distinct. When you take a look at the leaflets themselves, one of the things that stands out are these two little kind of teeth at the base of each leaf. And you flip that over and you get two nice little glands on the bottom side. So I've got those circled um, uh, on the left there. That's, that's the top surface of the leaf. On the right there, you see the actual glands and they're very prominent. And so those are one of the things that really helped us stand out for any type of um, pinnately compound species, you know, that have lots of leaflets like this, these glands jump out. Flowering wise, this is something that um, is interesting about Tree of Heaven as a dioecious plant having both male and female plants. So you get you get the male flowers on one tree and females on another. And the flowers themselves, they're, they're terminal clusters and they're they're kind of they're not that big, they're not very descript, small, pale yellow, greenish. And the male ones are the ones that stink, interestingly enough. The female flowers have no odor. Now the rest of the plant stinks pretty bad, but in this case, the male flowers stink too. Now, this is going to come up a little bit later in the discussion, but I'm going to go ahead and throw it out here. And since this is a dioecious plant, it offers the opportunity of shutting down seed production by, say, controlling all of one of the sexes, the seed producing uh, sex, which would be the females. If you can catch it when it's flowering, you can actually, uh, and you can reach the leaves, the flowers themselves, you can actually identify which ones are males and females based upon taking a close look. And what I've done here is separate out the pistillate or the female flowers on the right from the staminate or male flowers on the left. The staminates have a nice, uh, you can see the pollen sacs there um, uh, exerted above, uh, which stand out. Um, but you know, Steve, how often have you trained your people to actually identify these in the field? Yeah, it's it's rare because this is going to be up in the canopy. Um, yeah. Maybe now with some of the new drone photography technology, there might be more opportunities to photograph and uh, get a good idea of this if you can zoom in really well on the photograph. But it's very, it's quite difficult. Yeah. So a better way to do it is is you know you can wait <laughs> wait for the fruits. Yep. So you know following successful pollination. The female trees begin to produce uh, the fruits, which are a very lightish yellow color early on. And as they mature, they redden. And, you know, this is one of the reasons it's been such a prominent horticultural species because it's very showy in terms of the fruits themselves. But it's a great marker. When you see these on a tree, you can say, yep, that's a female. And that is likely produce, actively producing viable seed. And so, um, you know, the lack of these doesn't totally indicate, you know, that it's a male, but it's a pretty good indicator for the most part. So if you have trees that are never producing fruits, then they are very likely males, even if you've never looked at a flower. Now, for me, Steve, there is one smell that comes to mind with, with Tree of Heaven. And I'm telling you, when I was working on this out at UC Davis during graduate school, um, the rancid peanut butter smell was just absolutely disgusting with this plant. Heaven forbid you crush a bunch of leaves in a classroom, which what my, which is what my professors did. Um, but uh, everywhere I've worked on this, I've still walked away with that rancid peanut butter smell. So what do you, what do you think? I, I, I like peanut butter, so I'm not going to do that to peanut butter. <laughs> I, I think it smells like burnt popcorn. Like the really, you put it in a microwave and you overcook it. And you just can't eat the bag anymore because it smells. And then the microwave, everything you cook there for the next three hours smells like that. <laughs> Burn popcorn, definitely. All right. Well, I love peanut butter too, but I feel like Tree of Heaven has defiled it with the rancid smell. So, um, okay. So a few things on biology that really come into play, and I try to target this on Phragmites, really talking about the invasive characteristics. And Tree of Heaven is like a, the poster child of invasive characteristics. Seed-wise, uh, those seeds I just showed you, they're actually, um, this is the fruits, uh, the individuals, and they are what are called samaras, which are these flat and winged fruits. What is um, that fanciness? 
Uh, you got it, man. Uh, and each of these has a single seed you can see right in the middle. Um, you know, things like maple trees have the Samaras too, and, and you can see the little helicopters coming down. Um, so clearly wind dispersal comes into play with these things. Now, the time to sexual maturity, seed to seed is four to five years. You know, so if you think about an oak tree that it may be 10 to 20 years before the first bump of crop of acorns occurs with, with tree of heaven, it's a numbers game and it's producing seeds so much earlier than most native trees are. Uh, it's been estimated that over the 40 year lifespan for tree of heaven, 10 million seeds are being produced with viability of greater than 65%. Now most tree of heaven may not last quite this long, but they will last over a hundred years. And so you can get some pretty old individuals out there. The one good news about the seed is the longevity is short. They're short lived. They don't form a persistent seed bank uh, which is wonderful. So generally the seed that are produced this year are going to germinate next year and, and that's their one shot. So it's not that you're going to have tons of tree of heaven seed for 10, 15, 20 years in the seed bank like we have with other invasives. Um, so that's a good thing we got going for us. Now it's not preferred. These seeds are not preferred by birds or wildlife. There's very few species that are actually attracted or interested in them. The plant is full of sticky, stinky, nasty stuff. And in general, it's just not attractive, like a lot of the, right the fruit of producing. Heaven. I didn't know if you wanted to join. Um, it was sent to me hey, we got by Nancy oh, Cosmo. Somebody might want to mute there. So stand by. If your name isn't Dr. Enlow or Mr. Manning, please mute your mic. Mm. All right, no problem. Cool. You know, so what's fascinating about this is a lot of other, you know, um, uh, fruit producing trees are, are really dispersed by frugivorous birds and wildlife. And, and in this case, this one is not. And so we, we really think about how these seeds are getting around and it has a lot to do with uh, human mediated dispersal um, and some wind and some water, of course, but it's not one that's just getting spread all over the place by wildlife. So Steve, you know, tree of heaven, we'll get to the asexual reproduction, but seedlings, this comes up you know, oftentimes if you look inside of dense stands of Tree of Heaven, how many seedlings do you actually see? Oh, there can be thousands of seedlings in, in a small area. And oftentimes, um, we were talking about this in the past, sometimes it's it's coming off the root, you'll see the different root growth, but the seedlings will be there too. So it's a big mix and there could be a thousand different ones, thousand growing underneath an area where um, the canopy is pretty thick and there's a lot of seed coming off of it. Yeah, which is fascinating. There'll be a lot of self thinning there, but the bottom line is it, these seeds are highly viable, ready to germinate. And if conditions are right the following spring, you get carpets of these things. And, you know, sometimes we don't see a lot of viable seedlings for other invasives underneath stands of themselves. It's like it's self limiting. But with Tree of Heaven, yeah, it, it seems like uh, they can definitely germinate under their own canopy without a problem. And when, when there's seedlings there, it's and you're treating a stand of tree of heaven we'll talk about the methods later you have to be really aware of the leaf clutter and what might be growing underneath there because if you leave one or two of these your stand will be back within 10 years so it's really important to in some cases put down your tools and even this is about the only time you could hand pull an ailanthus is when it's about this small maybe a little bit taller and it's a seedling it'll pop out of the ground in softer soil but put it down and get them out of there because it's really important in the management yeah, and so in this case, this is a very short window, but you've got the seed leaves of the cotyledons there, which are very distinct from those, uh, you know, compound uh, leaflets. And here they're almost completely round, uh, you know, very spatulate shaped. And so those things will drop off relatively quickly. So it's not like you're going to get that for a long period for identification. Um, but if you've got a carpet of these things and you look up and you've got tree of heaven above you, then there's pretty logical what you're dealing with there. <laughs> now, this, the, 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 the issue that so many land managers I've talked to have struggled with is this issue of, of sort of clonal growth. And we know that a single tree of heaven can literally spread and expand to cover an entire acre via root growth alone. Tree of heaven turns out it's got like five different ways of producing asexual growth. And this diagram on the left kind of shows that from lateral roots uh, to different epicormic uh, buds, to, to ax, um, axillary buds and adventitious buds coming off of the uh, the actual, uh, say, a cut stem wound all the way down on the trunk itself, all the way to cut stem pieces. 
Turns out the species is just so regenerative from cut pieces. And, you know, what we tend to see is, is uh, this is one of the reasons why control is so frustrating. So many people early on would try and mow it down or cut it down and it would regenerate a cut one, get 10, you know, new shoots coming back. And Steve, you know, when you think about projects that you've kind of come in on, what is the first thing you think when you, you talk to somebody that's asking you to do work and they tell you that they took a chainsaw and cut all their Ilanthus down and it all grew back and now they want you to control it? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's one of the least preferable methods for controlling Ilanthus, first of all. And one of the biggest reasons is you can see it in the picture there. If you cut it, and you treat that stump, you feel like you're getting a good kill, but that herbicide is not going down into this root system the way it really should. Um, and even up to three years later, it still looks like you had a good kill. But what we've seen is usually two to three years after you cut that stump, the next year you will have thousands of these suckers coming up all around that stump. The stump will still be browned out, but you'll see these guys popping up everywhere. So um, this, as we go forward, you'll, you'll see We'll talk about cut stump, but it's probably not the most preferred method for this type of, for this plant. Yeah, so my, yeah, absolutely. And the point here just really drives home just how regenerative this is from, you know, from below ground and from the stumps themselves. Now, I've shown this picture here, Steve, and, and Steve sent me this. It's it's a fantastic one. That must be one of Steve's old cars. Uh, <laughs> my new no, car. this, is, this is classic. And, and the reason I show this picture um, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did the Ilanthus cause this damage to the car? So if you look at this car as kind of an ecosystem, there's been this idea that that Ilanthus only invades disturbed areas. So something where there's already damage, where there's some sort of human-mediated disturbance. And and the evidence for that is touted because it's all over roadsides and rights of ways and, and forced edges, you know, and fragmented areas. You know, so suggesting that where we've heavily disturbed it, that's where Ilanthus comes in. So we've already broken, quote unquote, broken the ecosystem, and then Ilanthus is just going to take over because it's broke. And and there's some evidence to suggest Ilanthus struggles to invade really intact eastern forest. Um, and you know, the the problem is disturbance is a natural part of literally every ecosystem on the planet, and Ilanthus finds its way into even relatively intact forest in cases just based upon natural disturbances along with human mediated. So yeah, there's some real good correlation and good evidence for, you know, it's, it's spread and dispersal, you know, via human mediated disturbance. Um, but in general, Ilanthus is very successful at, at uh, opportunistically taking advantage of all sorts of natural disturbances to insert itself into ecosystems where that colonial growth really begins to kick in. So um, so thanks for that picture, Steve. I think it's fantastic. When you think about, you know, with suppressive impacts, it's known as a, what's called an allelopathic plant where we declare chemical warfare. Um, you know, it's releasing secondary compounds that can inhibit the germination of all kinds of other species. It's also extremely competitive and it forms a dense canopy with a lot of leaf area. So it's going to inhibit regeneration just from a competitive standpoint, along with any allelopathic standpoint, too. And so what we can see is, is, you know, dense monotypic stands of Ilanthus without much else growing underneath them, um, just highly suppressive. And, you know, given the fact that it's so little utilized by so many um, wildlife, you know, clearly when you change the structure of the community, you're doing negative things in, in terms of the ecosystem overall. So all that kind of stuff you've heard about invasive impacts, it really applies for Ilanthus, and there's really good evidence of that in across ecosystems here in the U.S. Now, I am not an entomologist, nor do I pretend to play one on TV, but I got to tell you, um, this picture kind of creeps me out, and it's the fundamental reality, and I know that, Doug, you can talk about this till the cows come home, but um, <clears throat> Tree of Heaven is the preferred host of spotted lanternfly, Lycorma deliculata, and this is an invasive insect from, I uh, do believe it's, it is from China, that was introduced into Pennsylvania about eight years ago when it was first detected. And it has rapidly spread. Um, it forms very, you know, incredible densities, high colony numbers that results in tremendous feeding damage on a lot of different species. But it's a great concern for a lot of horticultural crops, uh, grapevines. Um, it is just a very nasty invasive pest 
And, um, you know, after it's feeding damage, it exudes, uh, oh, sticky sap, which attracts all sorts of other insects and then uh, results in the propagation of a sooty mold. So this is like, there goes the neighborhood. You know, you already got Tree of Heaven coming in. And then this insect follows it. And then all the damage it does is just a subsequent cascading negative effect in terms of invasive species. So, yeah, Steve, some, you know, have you... Some, have something you actually, else I noticed on that yeah. slide, Steve, is that once you take care of the lanterns flies, you take care of the tree of heaven, um, you've got the Japanese stillcrest there that's going to take over when all the sunlight moves around. <laughs> yeah, another invasive sitting right there in the wings. Luckily, it's, uh, um, yeah, so you're right. I, I didn't even realize that. Now I'm looking at it and I'm like, yep, that's exactly right. So, you know, we're going to come back to this sort of this, this insect because there's some ideas about controlling this insect via utilizing a um, leaving some trees as kind of trap trees uh, for it. Um, but there's a massive encouragement across the northeastern U.S. right now to control Tree of Heaven to eliminate the preferred host of our, our very highly preferred host of spotted lantern fly. So, Doug, I don't know if you want to add anything to that at some point in the conversation here, but, man, we'd love to have, the you know, the the uh, uh, the input that you might bring to the, the spotted lantern yeah, fly yeah, discussion. Yeah, on this just, just one thing from, a, from, the, from the DOD community. Just note that uh, uh, DOD policy is, is is that DOD installations that do become infested uh, in, in counties that are quarantined uh, generally play along with the uh, with, with the county and state quarantines and, and uh, to the best of their ability so that DOD assets don't uh, rapidly spread this pest anywhere. Uh, and also, I should note that uh, it does impact uh, the logistics for, for DOD uh, movement of, of uh, military materiel. Uh, states like California now have an external quarantine that uh, uh, certain times of the year where all uh, incoming cargo that come from quarantine counties need to go through a, a state inspection process as well. So it, so, so it is uh, uh, in increasingly problematic for, for DOD. And, and now we've got well over a dozen installations in the Northeast that uh, are infested with this insect, and, and uh, we expect a lot more this year. That's really all I have to say about that. But okay, thank you. This, this is awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's great. All right. Okay. So, you know, we've given some background. We've laid out some of the aspects of its biology, uh, the impacts, this issue with the spotted lantern fly. What I wanted to do is sort of turn the discussion now into, okay, what can we do about it? Um, you know, given when my first Tree of Heaven uh, study went out, I was working with Jody Tommaso at UC Davis, and, and we were out in California working on this plant back in the late 1990s. And and, you know, since then, I've talked to a lot of land managers across the country who are struggling with Tree of Heaven. And, and, um, and you know, there's a lot of frustration with it. And, you know, as I've tried to put my finger on exactly where a lot of that frustration came from, I think a good portion of it has often come from sort of this issue of a, a disconnect with the management itself. So not fully understanding how to go after it. Um, we're going to say some things, Steve and I are going to sort of make some cases that it may not be as difficult to deal with as you think, and that may result in gasps from the audience. But um, what we want to do is sort of go through what we know and understand about the different approaches for control. We talk about cultural stuff, and we're talking about prevention for the most part there. And if you're on this discussion, you've already got Tree of Heaven and you are trying to deal with it. You know, we have good educational programs and there's a million extension bulletins on Tree of Heaven across the U.S. Just about every land grant who's got it has, has got good information online regarding control. Um, some of those uh, you can see are often written from a little bit more of a forestry or silvicultural perspective than they actually are an invasive plant perspective, though. So we're going to bring it bring it back from an invasive plant perspective here. But when we think about physical, we'll go through some of that. I'll, I'll give you the updated status on potential biological control of Tree of Heaven. And then we'll get into chemical and the different techniques, because that's what it often sort of comes down to as the way that we are most successfully dealing with Tree of Heaven. So, Steve, I put this picture back in here because you had some things you wanted to say about it um, uh, based upon some of the former work that you had done when I showed this to you. Sure. So I look at a site like this and you, it can be much worse than this with Tree of Heaven. I'm sure you guys have seen it, especially on edges and kind of going back into a forest. But we just I just want to kind of emphasize as we get into the control part of this that um, the mulching machines are not always the preferred tool um, to just go in and non-selectively take out, you know, a crop of 
tree of heaven. I think you really have to think about what's on the, in the understory, what's good that's in there and put a price tag on it. So one year, quite a few years ago now, we went to a state park in Tennessee and we found this very large stand and we took a small sample area. Um, it was about a quarter of an acre. And we just went through there and looked at the plants, kind of wrote them down, figured out their sizes, figured out their heights, the native species that were in there from herbaceous to trees, um, mixed in with this, you know, really dense stand of, of ailanthus. And we took it to the native nursery and we got prices for all of it and what it would cost to put it all back there. And that little quarter acre spot, you know, I, we came up with around $40,000 worth of plants that if we were not selective, we would end up killing um, that actually we would prefer to have in that area. So just a, just a little plug to not always go with the biggest, meanest looking tool because sometimes the selective tools will actually save you a lot of money in the long run. Yeah, from, and from an ecosystem restoration context, uh, your, your words are very well taken there. We know, the, and I'm not bad mouthing the restoration industry, but the price of native seed and the price of native plants is, is often, it's, it's a very expensive industry right now. And so restoration is one of the more costly components um, that, that, we, that we deal in. And so any chances that you have to preserve native plants from the get-go by utilizing more selective treatments, that is, a, that we think that's a really good thing and advocate very strongly for it. Absolutely, Steve. Okay, now I showed this slide last week and it was part of the discussion on Phragmites. And I'm going to show it again because I'm hoping that we've got a bunch of people who weren't on here last week that are on here today. And as I've worked with DOD and a lot of installations across the country, I've recognized that there are some fundamental sort of universal issues that, that I see across military installations. And it has to do with contractors, subcontractors, applicators. And what I would encourage you as natural resource managers is get to know your contractors and get to know the applicators. Because I have run into a lot of situations where I've seen vegetation management companies, I've seen invasive plant management companies, and I've seen lawn care companies that were on a subcontract uh, through the civil engineering firm that, that happened to get the veg, ma veg management contract. So you will find that different companies have a different philosophy and a different mindset or mentality regarding the way that they will approach invasive plant management problems. Right away, companies often are very good at vegetation suppression, but if that's their focus, and 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 um and they are, are used to driving a truck down the roads and simply spraying, you know, turning the turning the sprayer on while they're driving from the truck. They're going to come with a different mindset from the boots on the ground, wake, going through the woods, uh, for IPT type approaches. Um, you know, I, I know it's meddling. I, I know I get into meddling when I start talking about contractors. Um, but uh, the bottom line is, I strongly encourage you. Really get to know and understand your contractors, especially if you're locked into these like five year type contracts uh, where you're going to have somebody there for several years to, to really know and understand what their mindset is on addressing invasive plants in particular. OK, because they will often come with applicators who may not know what they're doing, who like to spray straight above their heads and um, and can result in significant non targeted damage where there shouldn't be any. OK. Okay, so we're going to sort of go through just about everything we have in terms of techniques because um, I think it's important. Uh, you know, we're chemical heavy. Yes, we admit that. Um, it's a reality of the industry, but um, let's go through everything. Hand pulling. Uh, so the bottom line here is I got a nice diagram on the right hand side of this image, and it shows the lateral spread of Tree of Heaven and the depth of the root system in terms of uh, younger uh, trees. And you can see what I've pulled up there. Um, it's a very closely related species, but uh, bottom line is that shallow lateral system is very characteristic. And that's what you're gonna see with Tree of Heaven. So what does this equate to in hand pulling, Steve? You already said it, but go ahead and reinforce that for the audience. Uh, that you break a lot of the roots off in the ground? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, the hand pulling is extremely difficult. Um, and, you know, if you don't catch it as a very, very small seedling, it is almost impossible um, to actually get these things up out of the ground. And now, what if you kick it up a notch, Steve? So, you know, when we look at uh, assisted, mechanical assist, so I know that uh, you've invited uh, the folks who make these to the Innovations Conference, and uh, there's some good things out there, but what are your thoughts on Tree of Heaven with uh, these types of assisted devices, like the uprooter, the weed wrench, or the polar bear? 
I think they're good for volunteers and for teaching people how to do this. I think for the most part, though, you end up putting the tool down and pulling out a mag matic and having to dig the excess roots out that broke off when you're yanking them out of the ground with this. It, these excavating tools, um, these leverage tools, excuse me, work well in soft soils. So if you're working in an area where the soil is soft, maybe it recently rained, there's not a lot of clay, not a lot of rock, um, this might work pretty well. It might be sandy soils it works well in, but if any other type of soil, you're just gonna be breaking those roots and what looks nice and clean when you're finished will be growing back in about a year. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that completely. These things are a pretty good workout. That thing's about 18 pounds, I think. Um, so they're, they're kind of hefty and um, they can do some good, but with that lateral root system, again, it always comes back to the lateral roots for Tree of Heaven and they do break readily. So it's difficult to get them up out of the ground in most situations. Yeah, I, I would suggest this, if you're going to pull it, and I, I do it sometimes just because it saves time when you're cutting something or you're working through a forest, just pull really slowly in the softer soil and the roots will kind of fold and bend out of the ground. And you know if you've broken one off or not, because it's pretty clean when you do it that way. Yeah, and the other thing is, you know, if it's a lateral root sprout, you're not likely to be able to pull it if it's, you know, coming off of a really well-established lateral root. Yeah. And that's and the more effort you put into that, it's gonna break very quickly and you'll get no root at all. And so and that's, that's gonna result in rapid re-sprouting. So, so let's kick it up a notch. Uh, mulching machines are, are often utilized in terms of habitat management, opening up sites, uh, you know, uh, getting in just to very dense infestations. Um, so, you know, Steve, what are your thoughts on, on these types of mulching machines for Tree of Heaven? Yeah, and I know I've probably spoken about it with a lot of people on the call here today, but um, mulching machines are great for clearing an area where there's a real monoculture of invasives in the understory. Um, but that's all it's doing is clearing it. Um, it's not actually controlling the plant. You're leaving the roots in there. You're leaving the plant alive. So you have to come back with some type of treatment. Some people come back through and follow up with spraying the stumps, but you really can't wait that long to spray a stump to make it effective. So probably the best way to use a tool like this, and you can save money if you use these tools. We're doing it here in Nashville right now. Um, we'll go through areas that are pretty much a monoculture of privet, bush honeysuckle, maybe, you know, tree of heaven mixed in there. And we will cut it down because the difference in labor cost is significant if you had to go through there and cut and treat with chainsaws because the overstory is desirable. So we'll go through with the mulching machine, we'll knock it all down, and then we'll wait until the next year and then a year after that and just foliar spray the, the stuff that sprouts back up. So instead of having to treat things that are 10 feet, 100 feet over your head, you're treating things that are below your knee. Um, so you're able to walk through there with a the team with backpack sprayers and just kind of scoot through there and get most of the, the growth out of there. And that that's that's can be an effective method of doing this. And in fact, if you've got hundreds of acres of high intensity tree of heaven or other invasive uh, plants, this is a good way to save some money in doing it. Yeah. Now, one thing I will say, there's a caveat I like to say about this. If, if, if somebody's promising that we'll mulch everything down and immediately follow and treat the stumps, right. I, will, I will tell you, there is going to be a whole lot of stumps that don't get treated. Exactly. Um, you can see that inset picture on the top right here. That's it. Uh, these mulching machines often tend to shatter stumps a bit and make a very rough surface. And they also bury them underneath several inches of mulch in a lot of cases. And it's impossible to find. So the fundamental reality is if you are putting all your eggs in the cut stump treatment basket after a mulching machine, you're going to be highly disappointed because this is what you're going to get. Yep. Um, you'll have a ton of shoots coming off of buried stumps uh, that just absolutely, you know, we did not get control from. So keep that in mind when you're working through options and planning with contractors, um, you know, that will be using these machines that, it is physically impossible to find the cut stumps of most of these when there is a heavy mulch layer on the ground. Now, I'll add to that too. If you do the mulching and then come back and spray method, Tree of Heaven grows really fast. So if you don't have a plan of action and a budget to, to come back and spray the, immediately the next year and then the year after that, uh, you're gonna end up with a 10 foot tall plant again, you know, and have to start using different methods yeah, again. yeah it is yeah the regeneration in that first year is so fast uh, you know if you're trying to do a foliar treatment you've got to be on your toes very quickly that following year okay 
What about prescribed fire? So, you know, this is something that we advocate for in so many systems. Uh, you know, there's been such a push to get fire back into a lot of systems around the country. And, you know, and in a lot of, uh, uh, and it's really useful and important. You know, what do we know about prescribed fire and Tree of Heaven um, control? Well, we know that um, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> we know that um, fire typically will create conditions that are very conducive for new seedling germination of Tree of Heaven. It will girdle, establish trees, but we will typically see massive, massive root sprouting following a prescribed fire event in Tree of Heaven. So you wanna add anything to that, Steve? No, I think you're just basically creating the palate for the Tree of Heaven and that still grass to pop back up and grow even stronger, so. Yeah, so, so the thing is, if you're working on integrating fire in, just recognize that um, where you have Tree of Heaven, really mark that for very intensive follow-ups. Um, you know, so I'm not saying don't burn. I advocate for burning everywhere we can. I'm a bit of a pyromaniac like that. But overall, um, just recognize that um, you're going to have to put some intensive effort in following fires. Okay. Where are we at with biological control? So this is something that has, that has uh, been, uh, people have been looking at for years now. And there's an insect, uh, um, and uh, the pronunciation on the Latin on this is insane. Uh, Eucryptorhynchus um, brantii, or brantii. And uh, basically, we've had a, a petition as recently as last year, um, which was a recycled petition from uh, uh, 2018, which actually is a recycled petition from the early 2000s. So, Entomologists, biocontrol specialists have been submitting this specific insect to a TAG, which is the technical advisory group uh, that USDA APHIS then uh, uh, takes their information and reviews to approve biocontrol releases. And so we're sort of on, we, this one keeps coming back to the surface in terms of petitions for it. It is currently sort of, uh, um, you know, waiting uh, to be reviewed uh, by USDA APHIS. At this point, we talked about uh, Phragmites last week and the potential biocontrols for that. Well, guess what? This insect's sort of in that same batch of, uh, of, of uh, tag approvals uh, waiting um, for the uh, um, approval by USDA APHIS. Now, this is actually uh, being reviewed again by tag, so I think it's a little behind the Phragmites uh, insects, but overall, it's an insect that does considerable damage to Tree of Heaven, but uh, to date, it, it just hasn't completely passed muster for approval. And so I would say don't hold your breath for this one. I think we may be a ways off on an effective biocontrol for Tree of Heaven. Okay. Okay. Herbicide treatment. So, you know, and I, and, and I left goat grazing out of this talk, Steve, um, and you might want to, now would be probably the time for biological control. Mm -hmm. uh, to get into it. I know that you've invited goat folks to the innovations conference and, you know, what are your thoughts on the use of livestock or grazing cl different classes of grazing animals to address tree of heaven problems? Well, a lot of what we've been talking about so far are pretty non-selective methods and I'd say sheep and goats are the same, but they certainly have a place in the toolbox. Um, they, they are, it's, it's not a one and done deal with, with, goats either. You have to bring them out every year. You have to have a cycle that they go through and eventually um, they will wear it down to the point where, you know, they've eventually taken out the seed bank. But you just have to make sure you have all the, um, the system in place to make sure that the goats, the sheep are protected while they're out there grazing, um, that they're out there long enough and that you have a cycle of either two times a year or at least once a year where they're coming out and knocking it back at the right season. Yeah. Okay, so you know, if you want to talk more on the grazing stuff, uh, we can we can sort of come back to that for sure. But let's get into foliar herbicide treatments, and and this is where you know this is the starting point uh, in terms of the herbicide world. Um, you know, Steve, you you've run so many crews. You've got a couple a picture here you threw in of a couple of backpacks. You got any thoughts on just backpack aspects? Yeah. Uh, before we actually get into herbicides themselves. Yeah, and, and so many of the tools we use change every year, especially now with part deficiencies and you know people not being able to get the right kind of parts to build the right kind of tools. Um, but even now, I'd say the two best brands out there are Jackdo and Shindaiwa in terms of being able to handle herbicides the best, be able to handle 
either water-based or oil-based. These will last the longest um, and probably the easiest to get spare parts for still. Um, so I just put these up here because whether you go a Solo or Birchmeyer or other brands, some are a lot more expensive and have better warranties, but I think bang for the buck, these are probably just the best models we, we utilize on the ground. Yeah, I've, I've used the steel backpacks. I've had some success with those. I've done use Solos quite a bit. You know, but I think that, um, you know, folks are always looking for something that's going to provide a little bit better mm -hmm. um, in terms of backpacks. A um, couple of notes, you know, we mentioned the rapid growth rate of Tree of Heaven. And, you know, especially if you've done some sort of cutting, you've got to get out there fast. And here we've got stuff that's already 10 feet tall on the left there picture. And, and you know, I'm 6'2", six, six and so I get nervous putting a sprayer above my face. I don't like to do it. Um, and so you've really got a plan to make sure that your contractors can get back out there quickly and efficiently before it gets up over your head. Because once it reaches a certain, you know, height, it makes the backpack work really, really difficult and goes beyond the realm of, of you know, safe applications in my book. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that picture on the right, Steve. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I really, think really guy's... pray. I hope that's just clean water in that tank. <laughs> I think he's he's doing a demonstration in the point. But the point is, with these high-powered handguns, we can, you know, we can get up 20 feet. But um, I, it's not something I advocate for in the treating of Tree of Heaven at all in terms of high-volume foliar over the top of 20 to 30-foot trees. Um, I, you know, I don't have an application that. for it in the understory though. And lots of times when there's a really dense understory of tree of heaven, before we do any of the overstory work, we'll go through and just foliar spray the understory and just back our way out of there. And then when that dries up, then we'll go back in and work on the taller vegetation. Yeah. Uh, another thing that, that I see, and I got to show this picture um over application you know 40 gallons per acre is a good for a backpack you know, i mean it's it's ample volume for backpacking tree of heaven even you know with a single nozzle backpack here you've got something upwards of 100 plus gallons and you know make sure your applicators are not doing things like this because this is a lot of over application excessive herbicide into the environment so when it's running when the herbicide is literally accumulating and running off the leaf tips then you have way over applied and Steve, what's the best way you train your con your guys, your applicators to, to spray to avoid doing this kind of stuff? Now, first of all, most of the time you don't have to have 100% coverage of a plant. You can cover about 50 to 75% of the plant and still get a good control, depending on the species. But when you're talking about tree of heaven, there's not a lot of foliage in the stuff you're foliar spraying. So you really want to get good coverage if you're going to do the foliar application. And you really, you just have to make one pass with your wand and have it on a more of a finer mist so that if you've got a good surfactant in with your chemical, it's going to stick. You might not even see it really on there, but if you've made a pass with your wand and you have the right nozzle, um, it, it'll be on there and you just move to the next one. Especially if you have a marking dye like a blue dye, you'll be able to see the tint in there. Yeah. <clears throat> Recommendations herbicide wise, you know, I, I know that things can be hard to get a hold of. Triclopyr amine, uh, Garlon 3A. Steve, I know that you guys have treated just literally thousands of acres, you know, with uh, the amine type products. And and so in your experience, you feel like you have seen very good control being somewhere between a 2 and a 3% solution of, the, of that herbicide or the 4 pound per gallon choline formulation of Vaseline. That's correct. Yeah. There is a newer formulation of Triclopyr, the acid formulation Tricera. It's worked really well on other species. It's a little heated up version. Um, I don't have data on Tree of Heaven. A one and a half percent has worked well on other species. It's one that certainly bodes for some testing that we look to be moving forward on hopefully later this year. Um, you know, when it comes to glyphosate, um, somewhere between a two and a three percent solution has also been uh, relatively effective. I avoid any RTU products ready to use uh, too low a concentration in that case. Um, but, uh, you know, triclopyr is kind of the, the, the standout, uh, which I'm going to kind of lean to. As you see dicamba and amazapyr here. I've drawn a line between these herbicides. I'm not a big fan mm -hmm. of dicamba in the woods. I just I don't like banvol type products um, in, the, in the woods at all. And I tend to lean away from that. Um, amazapyr, again, you know, it's a highly soil residual herbicide. You can get into a lot of trouble with non-target damage. 
um, especially in hardwood systems. And so, you know, one to one and a half percent solution has been effective, and that's kind of a right away treatment for the most part. Um, and I'm very hesitant to recommend that within most wood situations. Steve, how much amazapir do y'all use actually in most of your projects? Um, almost zero. Yeah. I was on two sites yesterday where previous contractors had utilized what I'm guessing was arsenal, um, and the overstory was dead. Um, it was kind of a sad scenario of, you know, nice forested hillside where they were treating bush honeysuckle and they used what I believe was an arsenal because, you know, a year later, the, the entire hardwood overstory was gone. Yeah, that's very likely. So, um, you know, so I guess I say take a mazapir with a grain of salt, extremely effective, but you got to be very careful on the non-target damage issues. And I see it more as a right away and maybe a pine silvicultural type treatment uh, as opposed to a hardwood treatment at all. Um, for any of these foliars, a good non-ionic surfactant is typically the way to go. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable recommending that at a quarter to a half percent on a volume to volume basis. Is there a better surfactant? Pick, you know, take your pick, get one you're comfortable with. If it's working for you, stick with it. Um, you know, I cannot recommend that one is better than the other. In general, getting a good surfactant in the tank is going to really help you in terms of uh, efficacy down the road anyway. Okay. So getting on to basal bark. So things that are too tall for foliar applications, you know, what we're doing is applying an oil soluble herbicide to the outer bark. That oil carries it through to the inner bark or the phloem, and that's the translocating. Uh, tissues that move sugars to the growing points or the meristems and a little bit will get into the cambium and that is the meristematic zone and that's really where you want the herbicide to be destroying um, the uh, the tissue there. Some will get into the sapwood where it could translocate upwards but most of our activity we're talking about the phloem and the cambium is where we're delivering the herbicide from a basal bark application. Now typically here's an example of basal bark treating uh, the bottom 12 to 18 inches you use an oil soluble herbicide mixed with an oil carrier applied to the entire circumference of stems typically the height is somewhere between 12 and 18 inches and historically we've always said stems less than six inches in diameter so basically that sort of puts you in a category of things too tall for foliar sprays that um, are um, that any bigger than six inches the bark is still thin enough or anything smaller than six inches, the bark is still thin enough for the oil to penetrate to get the herbicide to the phloem and the cambium. Now, we know from experience, larger ailanthus is susceptible. And I've kind of laid this picture in here. And Steve, you kind of want to just sort of talk through the different size diameters and how you would approach a mixed stand like this. Sure. With basic sure. bark application. <clears throat> yeah, every, yeah, basically everything. In our case, most of the things that are three to four inches in diameter and up, we will use basil bark or hack and squirt. But since we're talking basal application, the, the problem with spraying the smaller ones is you just waste a lot of herbicide. Um, you know, you can't you can't exactly spray something that small with really it would take a nozzle that small to get it on there and then it would take forever. So um, oftentimes this would be the some of the few scenarios where the root system is probably still shallow enough that if we cut that and just treat the stump, um, we're going to knock that plant out pretty quickly. So like on that one inch diameter, you would go to a cut stump on that just to use a whole lot less herbicide to get the same level of control. Yeah, and that's usually when we're walking through with our hack and squirt treatments because then we'll have the right percentage in the bottle to do that with. Yeah, now I ask you, what's the, what's the biggest tree of heaven you've ever treated with basil? We're going to look at it later. <laughs> really okay. big. All right, we'll get to it. Any, any comments uh, on spray nozzles, you know, for basal applications? You know, typically... Um, you know, what do you prefer to use? Uh, you know, I, I like fan tips in a lot of scenarios and it's tempting to use it in this scenario. But again, the fan tip will end up spraying a little off target too often. So I think when you get the, um, the adjustable nozzle spray tips, they work a lot better in this scenario. And you get a little bit more of a mist on there, um, which gets some good coverage that way. So the adjustable cone nozzle on the left hand side there so you can get anything from a straight stream all the way to a fine mist whereas with flat fan tips you're going to get a set fixed spray angle so the flexibility and adjustability of the the adjustable cone nozzles are the way to go i will say replace the plastic wand if it's on your sprayer it's too easy to snap that 
Thank you. Um, yeah. in the woods uh, very quickly. Um, these things, what about, you know, these little two liter bottles, Steve, do you like these? Uh, we don't, we use those for our cut stump treatments and other species that we treat, but we usually use the spray masters when we're doing basil spraying or um, some type of a, a hack and score treatment, because you know exactly what you have, what you have coming out of the bottle with each spray, pull of the spray yeah. treatment. Yeah, and my point in showing this picture is is not so much the bottle itself, but look at the amount of spray coming off of that stem. So mm -hmm. what's going on here is high pressure. So whether you're using a backpack or a small sprayer like this, use keep the pressure very low when doing basal so that you get that material onto the stems with a smooth bark species. You will get massive sort of ricochet off of the stems with high pressure. And, and so the bottom line is keep the pressure low and you will get much better coverage with and keep most of the herbicide where you want it on the stems instead of on the ground around that tree. Okay. <laughs> if you don't know about short fills, this is for basal jobs. These things are fantastic. What you see there is a 15 gallon container in the back and that's basal oil. That was probably bark oil blue, I suspect. It's got a, a dye already in it, which is a nice thing to have. But these short fills are called a light of customized larger batches. So we can take a two and a half gallon jug of Garlon 4 and put that entire thing into that uh, short fill um, and, and to get the concentration that we want. So in this case, we can get a 20% volume to volume by adding um, two and a half gallons to 10 gallons of oil there. And that's a really nice thing. So it avoids small individual backpack mixing and really helps you, uh, you know, avoid mixing errors and just get it all in there. Uh, in one fell swoop and that's very stable and you know so it's not that you have to use all that in a single day you can you can let that carry out over days or weeks even and uh, as long as you keep it agitated you'll be in good shape uh, i said before you know that one that was bark oil blue the dyes enhance the visibility steve do you know y'all use bar you probably use a lot of the blue uh spray in, or blue dye or yeah, the bark oil blue we, we've used blue most of the time there's a red one and a yellow one. And sometimes when you're doing multiple species, it's good to have the different colors because you can actually fill your bottles up and carry three different, you know, two liter bottles with you on one pass. And then if you're treating tree of heaven with one, you pull out the blue dye bottle. If you're treating another species, you know, it's in the yellow dye bottle. So you can just kind of mark them that way. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> so is this so the, biggest the biggest? Yeah, that's the biggest tree of heaven that we've basil barked. Yeah, so the reality is Tree of Heaven's very susceptible to triclopyr through basal bark, and that's crazy, insanely big. Um, but, uh, um, you know, it's, it's somewhat comforting to know that the species is susceptible enough that we can do a good job with basal. I will say, <clears throat> be careful. Um, there are some water-soluble products that are recommended for basal. You can get incompatible. Compatibility when you try to mix a water soluble herbicide with an oil carrier. And in this case, this was actually clear castor amazomox that we had mixed up with um, Impel Red. And man, it sprayed out cotton candy. And let's just say we'll never be using that sprayer again. Uh, it completely gummed it up. So be careful about incompatibility issues. For recommendations, the triclopyr ester has really been the absolute workhorse for basal applications, the 20% volume to volume in an oil carrier. And I do not recommend diesel for that or kerosene. I strongly recommend getting a good bark oil, you know, even a mineral oil, um, which is uh, both can, they can be very effective and are good carriers. The Pathfinder 2 is simply the ready to use version that has a coconut oil derivative um, as its oil carrier. Smells kind of good, um, but it's 100% and you're paying a premium for that product based upon its, the ready to use nature of it. Some folks have suggested milestone as a as a, which is a water soluble herbicide added in with Garlon for 20 percent, um, basically uh, in a compatible oil carrier and for milestone which is very water soluble, it takes just just a, a limited number of oil carriers that that milestone you can work with. There's some data to suggest this reduces basal sprouting, um, but uh, but I have not seen a whole lot of data to support this. I'm not saying it don't do it, but I'm saying um, that uh, that it's out there as an option, but you've got to have the right bark oil to do it. Amazapir is also listed the form of chopper, but again, it's got such low labeled use rates in terms of our maximum labeled rate per, per acre 
you can't get very far with it. And the amount of sore residual activity you get out of it, you're sort of setting yourself up for substantial non-target damage and going with the chopper type treatment, especially around other hardwoods. Hopefully, again, we're going to be looking at triclopyr acid. It is labeled for basal bark use, and it's provided phenomenal control of a lot of species down in Florida. Um, but uh, we want to look at it on Tree of Heaven hopefully later this year. Hack and squirt. So, Steve, you know, talk a little about hack and squirt. I'll, I'll set you up here and, and, and turn it over to you. You know, the target area, again, is, is making a well, a cut downward at a, at a downward angle that really penetrates and creates a well that the herbicide solution will be held in directly over the phloem and the cambium. You always cut directly into the sapwood itself. Um, the issue is making sure you get through the outer bark, which typically is not a problem with Tree of Heaven. So we make the hack and we make the squirt. You know, so getting that squirt into the hack is probably one of the most important things. And, um, you know, if you if you have applicators who are having trouble doing that, they, they probably shouldn't be necessarily doing hack and squirt. Uh, you know, from a tool perspective, you know, when I when you see a list of layer of tools like this, Steve, what do you think about it for hack and squirt? Yeah, so we used to use machetes. In fact, we bought like eight different styles of machetes, figured out which ones worked the best, did a lot of trial and error. What we ended up with were a lot more hacks on people's arms and legs than on the trees. Um, they're just not as safe of a tool. In fact, to the point where our insurance company said if we use them anymore, they won't insure us anymore. So we got rid of the machetes, um, even though they're the lightweight, easy version to get around in the forest with. Um, and it might be good for some people, um, but maybe not for a whole crew out there. Um, they can be a bit dangerous. So we sometimes use hatchets, but we also just use a really small lightweight chainsaws and we'll go around and make the cuts with those. I find that to be the easiest and quickest way of doing it. Um, makes a clean cut, gets into the bark obviously deep enough, and then you're able to just make that quick squirt into there by making your spacing properly. Yeah, you know, for for Tree of Heaven, I would prefer a hatchet over over a machete in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. um, with other hardwood species, when in Florida, the machetes work great on really soft woods. Um, but Steve's right, yeah, there there is an increased hazard in terms of injury with machetes for sure. Whatever yeah. the tool you're using, make sure you keep it sharp. There you go. And you're, you're treating hundreds a day here as well in yeah. the case I'm talking about. If you're tre treating, you know, a small patch of them every once in a while, it's a different story. Yeah. Spray bottle wise, this is typically what we deliver hack and squirt with. Kind of the thing I want to say about this is not all bottles are created equal. We've done some research on this and and we, we about 10 different spray bottles here. What you can see is literally every single one of them puts out significantly different volume per stroke. When doing hack and squirt, we're typically targeting about a mil of the herbicide solution in the hacks. So you can see from these, um, some of those are upwards of three and a half to almost four mils per stroke. And if your applicators are unfamiliar, um, they could be like filling those hacks up and running out 75% of that herbicide down the stems, wasting it. So knowing what your bottles put out is really important. Making sure that you're not overfilling hacks where the stuff is just running down the stems because that's going to be wasted herbicide. Some folks have advocated veterinary syringes. What you can see here is a bottle system. It's got a tank for your back uh, with a tube that connects to a vet syringe to deliver sort of surgical precision. You know, the thing about these is you're paying about 25 to 35 bucks for one of those syringes. Um, the backpacks are getting harder to find, um, but uh, they're effective and they can work, but uh, it's an added cost. And I don't really have a good idea about the longevity of the seals within these vet syringes for the solvents that are within our, you know, hack and squirt herbicides. What about spraying down the blade? You know, if you're using a machete, some folks will take and make the hack and then just spray right across the top of the blade to get the material into the hack. You know, that's kind of a, it's kind of an insurance policy to think you're getting it into the hack. What I find is it creates a lot of messy, drippy machetes with herbicide kind of all over the place. The, the more you do that. So I kind of advocate to make the stroke with the machete, pull the machete away and, and then make the application directly into the hack itself and keep your machete clean or whatever tool. And with a chainsaw, it's not, you know, you're going to do that. No problem. The treatments, you know, in this case, we're kicking up triclopyr to about a 50% solution. I'd say it's probably the top option. Um, 
for uh, for selective control. Glyphosate sort of, you know, has not come out as, as quite as effective as triclopyr in a lot of cases with a hack and squirt type approach. And so I tend to really lean towards triclopyr amine for this. Again, I've got a mazapyr listed there as an option, but uh, it leaks from the roots of trees. So even with very surgical precision inputs into the tree itself, you can see flashback and non-target damage from using a mazapyr uh, through this uh, through hack and squirt also. Uh, you know, Steve, when you think about hack spacing, I threw a couple more pictures in here. You got any thoughts on really what you like to see with Tree of Heaven um, in terms of hack spacing? Well, I think picture is worth a thousand words. Um, you can That's really good spacing there. I don't think you want to get any closer. Obviously, the goal is to let the tree kind of think it's, a, it's still alive while the herbicide's working because it'll take the herbicide up and down a little bit better. Um, so you don't, we, I think we may have another picture here that shows fully girdled or something like that. Um, that's actually gonna defeat the purpose of the way you're doing it. And that definitely defeats the purpose. And I, we, we can attest to this because over 25 years, we've tested so many different methods. Um, you know, this ended up killing the tree, but it really wasn't worth it. Um, and then three years later, excuse me, it killed that particular stump. Three years later, it was popping up everywhere afterwards. So, um, you know, 20 years later, yeah. we used hack and squirt with the even spacing. Yeah. Okay, we are about to wrap this up. So um, last thing, you know, we'll mention cut stump. Steve said it was really not uh, um, quite the preferred method here. Again, targeting the phloem and the cambium uh, in terms of the applications, cutting, treating immediately. We like to say seconds count uh, in this case. Um, and, and being able to treat small stumps, you know, they can be completely covered, but what we're trying to do is avoid this type of ridiculous over application where there's a lot of herbicide waste there. Um, multi-stem trees, again, you can see it's about a one to two inch band around that multi-stem clump. And you can see a year out, uh, we've got very effective kill of that thing. Um, so it can be effective. Um, a little note on size here. This is quite possibly the biggest cut stump I've ever seen in my life. And um, this is the type of tree that's likely to re-sprout no matter what you do in terms of a cut stump treatment. So we have just such a massive individual and there's good data to suggest larger stumps are harder to kill with cut stump type treatments. You wanna, you wanna, you wanna comment on that one, Steve? <laughs> this, is, this is when James Okerson was working with the Park Service, this was his EPMT and they came across this and I think Shenandoah and um, Honestly, I think they just wanted to cut a tree that big. Otherwise, they would have hack and squirted or tried basil bark. Probably on a tree that big, a mix of hack and squirt and basil spray uh, would get you a better kill. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, again, going back to water based treatments, glyphosate and triclopyr, the 50% concentrations, you can add a non axer fact in if you want to. It's a little bit of like a sticker to add to the top of the stump. Um, so I, I tend to do that. And, um, and the reality is, again, the larger the stumps, the more likely you're going to see some re-sprouting and there's really no way around it. Oil-based mixtures, that would be a basically cutting the tree and then treating the, the top and the sides of the stump. You know, this is with the Garlon 4 type approach, 25% uh, 20, volume to volume on that. And that's more of a right-of-way type treatment. Um, but uh, if you can't get Garlon 3A, it isn't, and you can't get Garlon 4, it is an alternative uh, for uh, for herbicide use there. To finally kind of wrap it up here, Steve, uh, the Easy Jet. You know, I know you've had a lot of experience with that uh, um, as this tool, which delivers uh, these uh, glyphosate or amazapyr filled uh, 22 shells, basically, um, into the cambium of the tree. So tell us your experience with that to wrap this up, and we'll bring it home. Sure, it can be really quick. If they don't buy one, um, they basically. Our experience has been that you kill about 50% of the tree, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. So you're always having to do retreatments on the same tree. You're also leaving these 22 shells in the tree. Um, they're just not that effective. Uh, I'll just kind of wrap my part up by saying a lot of tools look really selective um, and they are in terms of how they deliver the herbicide, but oftentimes they might have a more a higher percentage of herbicide. You might have to use more to actually get the proper uh, control on the tree. So you might actually be using more herbicide than you even need to. Same goes with this hypo hatchet tree injector. 
neat little idea. You know, momentum basically pulls the herbicide through the tube into the hatchet, and then it goes directly out of the hatchet into the mark into the cut area. But you're also walking around with a tube that's really loose and hangs off of you and gets snagged in trees and brush and everything else, and can pull right out of the bottle and drop herbicide everywhere. So, you know, sometimes they look good, but they're not always as good as they look. All right. So oh, to summarize, <laughs> you know, I think that. I think that we that we have enough operational experience and, and we have good data out there that Tree of Heaven is definitely manageable. It's not the hardest tree to kill, um, just in terms of efficacy. The re-sprouting from the roots is the big job, the big issue that, that comes back. So follow-up is always going to be important. I think triclopyr is kind of the, the workhorse in terms of, of overall Tree of Heaven management. Um, I think it's got a little more uh, power to it than glyphosate, especially for certain aspects of the job. Foliar, hack and squirt, and basil are really sufficient approaches to take care of it. And, you know, I would, I would say don't make it harder than it is. And cutting and, you know, walking away from cuts, uh, walking away from single management interventions and not doing anything for a few years is really going to increase the difficulty. And follow-up, follow-up, follow-up are the things that are going to be most critical in terms of getting on top of a stand, taking out that one-year flush of seed bank, and then sort of getting into maintenance control after that. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And we'll open up for questions now and, and stay and take questions as long as we need to. So thank you. Great. Thank you both. Uh, if you have any questions, please use your, your hands up icon at the top of your screen just to keep it simple. Uh, talk over each other. Okay, so I just unshared the screen, so we should be good there. Any questions? And I and I can't see any chat, so. Yeah, that's Doug. If you could monitor that chat for us, please. Any 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 comments? Any any thoughts? Concerns? Yeah, sorry, Doug screwed off. up the chat on this. I didn't uh, make it available to everybody. I learned a lesson on that. Let's see who we got. Somebody's got their hands up. So uh, when we go, the first one I see is a uh, Jacqueline Smith. Um, yeah, ahead. hi. The um, can you hear me? Yes, hey, absolutely. Yes, thank you. Here. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was it was really thorough. Um, hopefully we can put that some of that to use here. But um, Steve, you mentioned earlier a kudzu webinar. Uh, is there any way to get to that recording? Absolutely. Uh, send me an email and I will share the link to it. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. And, and my email was in the end, the last slide there. Um, did you write that down or get it? Uh, I did not. Um, OK, Armando's got it and he can definitely send it out to everybody on the list for sure. Okay. Doug. So yes, thank I'll be happy to share that with you. As well as Doug. OK, uh, yeah. Other questions? Steve Winslow. Hey, Steve. Great presentation. Uh, super helpful. We have some stands of of some really tall, um, fully mature um, trees, and we're, you know, it's really hard to get up into the basal area. Um, what are you thinking might be the the best approach to handling something like that? If you have a kind of a full stand, some of it is actually off our property, and then you you get to the point where you're gonna have seeds coming back in either way. Any any well, suggestions there? I would suggest the hack and squirt is the best. You're saying they're larger trees. Yeah, uh, tall, you know, 35 yeah. foot uh, yeah. trees are great. I would go through there with the hack and squirt. You're going to, first of all, you won't use as much herbicide and you'll actually get a, a little bit better kill. And it's a much easier method when you're dealing with large populations. If you're using a backpack and basil, you're going to go through a lot of herbicide um, on a large stand like that. So take, a, you know, what your preferred cutting tool, um, you know, use the mixtures we suggested and just get up there and start hacking and squirting it. You know, um, you'll see a really good kill. A lot of that'll get into the root system too, and knock out some of the smaller stuff at the same time. Uh, one thing I'll say is, on if you're on steep slopes, if these are big trees on steep slopes, you know, carrying a backpack across a steep slope is always difficult. And if you got a 750 mil squirt bottle, you you know, you're a lot safer yeah. at that point too. So the hack and squirt is definitely a good way to go there. I appreciate that. We have tried hack and squirt. Um, we have had limited success, but we might not have had quite the right mixture there. Um, we did notice though when we kill a tree, you're you're getting all the uh, the shoots coming up uh, right away. If you have that happen, um, what's the next best? Is it to treat each one of those stems individually, basically? 
foliar spray. You need to foliar spray okay. those. Or and, I spray those. So yeah, and yeah. I think your I think your hack and score might be a timing thing too. If you want to send an email to us afterwards, we can talk about timing and the mixture you're using. You should be getting a good kill. Where where are you located? Uh, up in the uh, north uh, west New York State. Okay, so yeah, you're probably your your window of opportunity is a little shorter uh, for the best control. But um, yeah. yeah, let's 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 talk about that. You know, off webinar, and I'll kind of give you some advice on that. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Dr. Burkett, do you have a question? Oh, nope. I, uh, <laughs> excellent hand raise. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So um, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate uh, all the participation and the questions. And, and feel free to follow up with us by email with other questions you have, comments. You know, if you got specific struggles that, um, um, you know, you want to reach out to us on, uh, feel free to drop us an email. I work with Armando. You know, I've, I've done co consults with uh, uh, multiple installations now on specific problems, and I'm very happy through my work with Armando to, uh, to, to assist and provide advice on guidance on lots of invasive plant problems. So feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks, guys. Thanks, hey, well, thank you both. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, before you guys go, just... Uh, that was just jaw dropping good, right? Oh my gosh, uh, I'm just, I'm just blown away. You guys gave away all the, all the, all the secrets for the, for the right, for the right mixes and the, and, and the right, the right tools for the right job. Uh, that's exactly what we need is, is uh, some of these applied webinars that can really help our folks out in the field. Uh, really, from the pest management community here at the pest management board, and and uh, uh, we just owe you a great debt. A great uh, debt of gratitude for 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 your time and effort for helping to support uh, our, our our field personnel and natural resources and and pest management uh, and and just uh, I think over the next week or so uh, I'll, I'll work with David Hill here at the, at the pest management board and and we'll get this uh, webinar and these presentations uh, posted so you guys can have those magic formulas for for how best to control this because tree heaven and and uh, Interflies is is is, is, is going to be a problem for DoD for 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 many years and and and, and uh, interfere with our operations. So uh, again, uh, yeah, thank you. Yes, absolutely, uh, absolutely, Doug. And Douglas, did you notice that we were just shy of seventy, and so that's at least oh, that's over sixty installations that we were able to get this information out to. So we're, we're very indebted to you both. Thank you very much. Oh, thank oh absolutely. You. Thank you guys for working on those installations, taking care of them. <laughs> Thank you all. All right, I guess Perfect. we're done. You take care, everybody.